Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Thursday afternoon just before Friday, Monday morning podcast, and I'm just checking in on you. How is your week going? Is it going well? I am in gloomy, rainy Vancouver, British Columbia, home of the BC Lions, the Vancouver Canucks, and the fucking Westminster Dog Show. I don't know, there's some place out here, Westminster, and I learned today that they do have a big dog show up here, but I don't think they are one and the same. I can't remember if Westminster takes place in Beverly Hills or in New York City, but all I know is that you have to be a particular level white person to be invited. I learned that because I thought I was white enough. You know, and they were like, uh, oh, no, you are not. And uh, my dream of attending it <laughs> was over. Um, I just think it's funny. I like dogs. And then it's just funny when they get them, all, like, you know, all shampooed up and they're prancing around, you know. And I don't know. There's always like that thought of what if the owner falls? Just adds to the tension, you know. Um, anyways, I'm up here in Vancouver. I'm having a great time. Uh, this past weekend, I went to a wedding. Uh, awesome wedding. Tremendous wedding. Two people that should be getting married. They totally had the connection. Is there anything worse? Unless you're just really into schadenfreude. Um, when you go to a wedding and you just see two people and you're like, this fucking thing is not going to last the weekend. I've been to two of those. And one of them, the marriage lasted two years, maybe. And then the other one, as far as I know, they're still together. Um, the first weird wedding that I went to, I think the bride was having second thoughts because the groom was standing up there forever. And then she just sort of walked down the hall, walked on down the hall, right? Walked down the, the aisle with their dad and did not have that look that, you know, somebody usually has on their wedding day. Um, and then when she went up to the altar, the whole time they were doing the vows, she was laughing uncontrollably, um, which, you know, sometimes it's just a form of nervousness, but uh, they didn't even kiss and as they walked out, they went ahead and kissed. But uh, as far as I know, they're still together. And then another one was uh, someone I was in business with when I first got in to New York City. And I went to this person's wedding. And I remember we, we went out there. And uh, the mother-in-law, we got there like it was traffic. And we got there right before... The wedding was going to start. It was in the backyard of these rich people's estate, right? This guy married into money, and he wasn't rich, so I think they didn't like him. So she was. we pulled up. She was outside walking the dog dressed the way you would walk a dog, like she wasn't really even ready. It was like sort of this nonverbal protest of what was going on in there. And uh, that seemed weird. I was like, well, you know. The in-laws usually never like the fucking person their daughter's marrying. They never think that he's good enough, right? So it didn't really, you know, it wasn't much of a red flag. But then I just remembered when uh, the groom afterward, they got married, he went to uh, give a toast as to why he loved his wife. And it was fucking brutal. He was like, uh, she, because she gave some big toast to him. And so then he goes, okay, uh, and, and to you, my lovely wife, you, uh, you, you, you make me laugh. Uh, <laughs> we're in the background, like, light of your life, reason you get up in the morning, like trying to help him out. It was one of those things where everyone was smiling, like, this is going to be great. And then it just became like everyone just sort of looking down, going, dude, wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. And that one lasted like two years. And it was such a fucked up marriage. I remember him telling me that they just had this big fight and they were both kind of exhausted. And one of them was just kind of like, what are we doing? And the other one was just like, yeah, do you like not want to do this anymore? And the other one was like, no. 
And then the other one was like, really? Because I don't either. And then they started laughing like a bad fucking movie. And they had a really amicable divorce. And I think he was cool. He didn't try to take any of her fucking money. And they just went their separate ways. <laughs> Having said that, this wedding that I went to, I always have that in the back of my head because as much as I like to do stand-up, I don't literally like to be living in a bit when I'm at a wedding, you know? Um, I don't know. I just saw them interacting right before the wedding, and you know it's super stressful if you've ever gotten married, and they just seemed chill and relaxed, so I was like, oh, good, good. Um, but what was funny about this wedding was there was also another bald ginger at the wedding with a red beard like my doppelganger and um i went there and i had a drink and then i had another drink and then i was just like yeah you know that's good i'm gonna stop there and i started drinking water now on the other hand the other guy was acting like me last year or before i took four months off of drinking and this fucking guy got fucking loaded right so i saw he was kind of swaying in the breeze and i'm like oh you know been there i'm not gonna judge he's having a good time whatever right so the fucking guy, next thing I know, I'm looking outside and this guy, like this wedding was so perfect. It was in this really cool restaurant and slash bar. And so up front was the bar and they had these ceiling to floor windows. And the evil version of me at some point staggered outside. and I just felt everybody looking and they looked and he just fucking puked in the street in front of like a third of the wedding it was up at the bar like a giant puddle of fucking, fucking puke. So all his friends rush outside in their fucking suits to help him out. And somebody brought a chair out. <laughs> well, they sit the guy down. And I'm not laughing at the guy. I'm just laughing because I've been there. I mean, not at a fucking, not having a whole wedding that I was just at looking at me. But, you know, we've all had our moments. I remember one time I was somewhere down the Cape. Fucking Cape Cod, Joe. Best fucking potato chips. Um, I somehow passed out on a bluff that was headed down towards the ocean. I was just like in the middle of the day. And uh, I forget where my buddy was. He was the one driving. He was somewhere, <laughs> he was somewhere else. It came out, something happened with the car. Um, and we were just passed out on like the fucking this. It was a bluff, right? I just like saying that word. I've never used it properly. And all of a sudden, I was laying there, and the sun felt good and everything. I was passed out, and like it felt like a day later. All of a sudden, I just hear, and out there, that is where the Nina, the Pinta, and the Pinta and the Santa Maria came in back in fourteen fucking blah 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 blah. And then I hear this little kid's voice go. Mommy, why is that guy sleeping there? And there was like some sort of fucking tour going on. And uh, I vaguely remember changing a tire. And I didn't put the jack underneath the frame. And it went like right through the floorboard. <laughs> so there you go. All right. I'm not judging this guy. But it was funny as fucking hell. So this fucking guy fucking just, you know, Great Lakes yak you know puke all over the street so somebody brings a chair out and they sit him down and he's sitting there hanging his head like you know jordan was sitting when he had the flu and they put the towel over his head he was sitting like that minus the towel over his head so then they start calling like an uber or lyft and these cars keep pulling up and they pull up to this bald dude with a red beard sitting with his head hanging down in a giant puddle of puke. And everybody would just pull up and be like, yeah, this fucking guy's not getting my car. They would drive away. And uh, it just became this thing like, dude, you got to move him down the street. You got to get him away from the puke. And anyway, somebody finally came along and took him home. But uh, he was definitely the highlight of the evening. So uh, I want—I don't know who that guy was, but I want to thank him for the, uh, the free entertainment. So anyways... Let's get back on track here. I'm up here in uh, Vancouver, and uh, as I mentioned before, I don't know if I mentioned, uh, I was talking to a number of people up here that listen to this podcast that fly helicopters, 
and one of them had access to the uh, Cabri G2. I hope I'm saying that right. Cabri or is it Cabri? I think it's Cabri G2, which is basically like the Robinson R22 that I fly, but it has, you know, any safety issues that the Robinson may or may not have, you know, that it, it does have. I'm just not trying to shit on it because I fly it all the time and, and I do, do like that helicopter. These people took it to the next level. It's like the next iPhone, except it didn't try to, like, you know, capture your fucking face. Um, it was new and improved. So I wanted to try this thing out, and um, these people had access to it. So I was going to rent a car today and drive about an hour outside of Vancouver. Um, but then I got a text from the guy I was going to fly with. said, hey, there's a guy here. He's a big fan of yours. He's got a fucking... Uh, he's got a 66 he'll pick you up right at the heliport downtown i was like fuck it let's do it so i show up this dude named chris i want to thank him great guy picked me up flew me all the way out there and i was telling him he goes so how did you get into wanting to fly uh the cabri g2 and i was like well you know i read all about you know the low g you know situations the mass bumping i got a little freaked out vietnam helicopter pilots I just kind of feel like it's a bit of a safety issue, and they just sort of taught pilots how to fly out of it rather than fix it. But what the fuck do I know? I only have 160 hours, right? But that was just my gut feeling. So I want to check this thing out, see what the deal is with this thing. So we land at the airport, and as we land, one of those Cabri G2s is coming in, and I immediately loved it. I loved the shape of it. And when it landed, seeing this little two-seater with the fully articulated main rotor system was like i mean that's that's been the dream um you know because with the r22 you got to lead with your collective with with those things you can just push the stick forward which uh it's still whenever i fly something like that when the guy just goes okay nose it forward i always have to make the joke that you know i usually don't hear that you know flying a robinson so anyways um the thing lands and as it lands i see this guy getting out who looks just like the dude that I saw in the YouTube video. I was like, that the guy who uploaded the video that did the whole, the whole thing from nose to tail review of it. He goes, yeah, that's him. And it was so surreal because I didn't know I was going to meet this guy. It was like literally the guy that was the reason that I wanted to fly it. I ended up not only going to his place, I ended up getting to fly with him. Uh, it's BC helicopters. And the guy's name is uh, Misha Gelb. And he was an incredible pilot. He did an auto rotation at the end that was just was unreal. For those of you who fly Robinsons, there's no watching your RPMs going too high, too low. It's just you just put the collective down and steer it. And he landed this thing like 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 a fucking daisy. It was incredible. And um, so, anyways, he he was filming the entire time that we were flying. And um, I was flying horribly. I could barely even, I couldn't even hold a hover in the thing because the main road had turned the exact opposite way. And as much as I told myself, ignore your muscle memory, just, you know, correct whichever way the nose is going. And it was also super sensitive. It felt like the sports suspension on a car, like a sports car, you know, um, where it was so hypersensitive that I just kept overcorrecting. And then it was, it took me back to when I had like under 10 hours flying and was just the first time trying to hold a hover but uh of course by the end i got way better than where i was at but by then his gopro had ran out so you can guys ha can have a fun time laughing at me flying this thing like a fucking salmon going up sea upstream it was pretty bad in the beginning but um i really really loved it and i got to fly um you know i mean it was definitely a cloudy day and everything but i thought it was kind of cool that it was raining out and all that just to fly in something different and um, got to go all along the uh, the whole skyline of Vancouver, all the way up to where all these rich people live and shit. And then uh, we flew back, and on the way back, we flew up this riverbed, which I hope he keeps that footage. That's one of the coolest things I ever did. Um, I felt like I was on, on, like, the Discovery Channel, like I should have been chasing a bunch of gazelles or something or watching hippos you know, fighting alligators or something out on the Serengeti. It was amazing. And um, we ended up landing off airport up there. We, we landed off airport in uh, just some farmer's yard. And that's when I was just like, I had it. The thing was all over the place when I was flying. Um, 
but anyways, I just want to thank everybody at BC Helicopters. I had, I had such a great time, and I will definitely be back. And uh, for those of you who do fly, if you get a chance to check out one of those Cabri G2s, they're pretty fucking amazing. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And then I got two more shows tonight at the Queen Elizabeth Theater here. And, um, and then I immediately go back to go hang with the family because that's the new me, right? I fly in the day of the gig. And then I do the gig the next day, and then I immediately leave because uh, I got my, you know, my lovely wife and my daughter. I gotta, I gotta get home to. So, but if I only leave for like two days, I don't have that much guilt. Will you feel like an absent, absentee father? You know. Um. So, anyways, um, what time do we got here? Just fifteen minutes, and I should probably do this read here. Okay, me undies, everybody. All right, you heard me talk about MeUndies, and you know that I am a big believer in their product. They're the perfect balance of comfortable fit. Every month they have new and exciting prints, and they arrive at your door in a fun bag. (laughs) Now, when I was a kid, that was a term for titties. Hey, look at the fun bags on that broad. Um, so I guess they, they ride, ride in a fun bag. Uh, MeUndies uses a lady. MeUndies uses Lenzig micro modal modal in their Cabri Cabri in their underwear. It's sustainably sourced, naturally soft fiber that starts with beechwood trees. The underwear is made out of trees, and ends with the most amazing fabric you've ever experienced. The results have been downright dreamy. Well, thank God. I wouldn't want to have my ball bag get stabbed with a splinter. MeUndies is so sure you'll love their underwear. They offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't love your first pair, you get a full refund. That's a no-brainer. Get 20% off a pair of the most comfortable undies that you will ever put on. Fuck, can I get through a sentence? To get you 20% off your first pair, free shipping and 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash Burr. That's MeUndies.com slash Burr. All right, let's take a second to talk about the fucking Oscars. Um, Congratulations to everyone who was nominated and everybody who won. But in particular, two people won. I don't know if you were paying attention, but two people that won an Oscar on Monday also do a voice on the wonderful cartoon, F is for Family. Alice and Janie, who did the voice of uh, Mrs. Plasterware, uh, she won an Oscar for the Tanya Harding movie, and then Sam Rockwell, who does the voice of uh, Frank's nemesis, even though he does, he's not even aware that he's his nemesis, uh, Vic Reynolds, won for three billboards. Um, so that's pretty cool. You know, I think that upped the ante of our show. The status, anyways. I know I'm throwing that in. Who does your show? Who do you do your show with? Oh, two Oscar winners. Alice and Janney and Sam Rockwell, right? Laura Dern, Justin Long, Dave Koechner. I mean, I can go on forever. Um, by the way, I'm really loving, the, I don't want to jinx it, but this season three. I know I'm teasing it early, but uh, we've been laughing our asses off in the, uh, the edit room. But I got to tell you, yesterday... I, I came in, landed, and I was really tired because uh, I did a show the night before, did uh, four Shaw's show down at the Improv, and I had a beer or two after at the end of the um, at the end of the show, and I didn't get home till like you know one in the morning or something like that. And then my daughter, my daughter gets up at like quarter to six, six o'clock. It's hilarious, you know. You just come downstairs. You can't, you know, in at this point, like the reason why I drink so little now is now I don't know what happened. Like if I have like, like one beer or two beers, like the next day, you know, my daughter wakes me up and it's just like, I feel it. So I'm waking up just not like hung over, but just feeling like less energized. And, you know, she's talking all this gibberish out there and I just open the door. And the second I open the door, she just goes, Hi. I don't know if I told you, like, hi is her word for everything. Hi means hi. Hi means I want that. Or if she wants attention, she does, like, this frantic, like, hi, 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 hi. Like, if she sees two people talking and she wants to be 
It's really like her being like, hey, 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 little help over here. Um, I want to get out of this fucking chair. So um, anyway, so I, I didn't get a lot of sleep and then I had to go to the airport and then I flew up. And whenever you fly in the plane, there's, it's always like everybody wants to sleep except for that one person who has the window open and then I can't fall asleep. So I get to the hotel and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to lay down here for like a half an hour. And I had South Park on. Speaking of, you know, animated shows, just total next level, absolutely fucking hilarious. And I was watching this episode where Cartman had stolen a bunch of votes. And... uh I, saw, I fell asleep, and I woke up a little later, and I opened my eyes, and South Park was still on. I didn't realize that they had a marathon going on. Like, they did, like, three or four episodes in a row. Long story short, my pickup for the 7 o'clock show is at 6.20, and I am asleep, and all of a sudden the phone rings super loud in my room, and I open my eyes, and it's pitch black in the room, and I was like, oh, fuck. And I was trying to find my way out, and I couldn't. I literally opened the door that went into a closet, and then Verzi called me, and I saw it was 6.30. And uh, I literally just threw my clothes on, didn't even iron my shirt, got to the venue, s- sipped a little throw coat tea, and went out on stage. Had a great set, though. But I was, like, really... Uh, it was weird. I was, like... I wasn't tired because I slept for, like, three hours, so I felt refreshed... But I also felt like I just woke up. So um, I don't know. The first 10 minutes of the show felt like an outer body experience. But uh, I, I've never slept like like that close up until like almost like missing a show or something like that. But uh, fortunately, uh, you know, it went well. I don't know. That kind of went nowhere, you know. I, I almost missed my show, but I didn't. And then the show went well. Like, did I really need to fucking tell you all of that? Was there a reason for that? I apologize if this recording sucks. I bought an, an external mic for my iPhone that uh, Kevin Shea, the hilarious Kevin Shea, who came on my show. That's right. Came on the Monday morning podcast, promoted his special, and told me all about this mic going, I love this fucking microphone. I'm going to have to talk to him about it because I ordered it off the internet there, the interweb, and uh, it was only 20 bucks. I'm like, how the fuck is a microphone only, that only costs $20 going to be good? And guess what? It isn't. It fucking sucks. So I must be using it wrong because Kevin Shea's a smart guy. So he's got to teach me how to use the fucking thing because it sounds worse than if I just hold the phone up like I am right now, if that makes any sense. But anyways, I, oh, my God, I have to tell you this fucking stupid T-shirt that I saw. And there's like some corporation up here, you know, selling clothes, one of those what, one of those fucking clothes in place. And on the mannequins, they have all this, these, these fucking political T-shirts about equal pay for women. And it says, like, enough is enough and something about equality and all that. And it's just like, I, I just can't, like, these fucking assholes. It's like, you are the guys not fucking paying people. Like, why am I getting a fucking leg? My voice cracking here. What the fuck are you... How do you get off selling those fucking shirts? And I don't understand why these feminist groups don't go in there and be like, okay, you're selling enough is enough t-shirts. Uh, why are you selling? Well, let's look into your fucking history of, of paying people. That's like this new, this new fucking thing. What it is, it's not a new thing. This is what people always do. When a movement happens and they get freaked out by it, what they eventually do is they join it. And once they join it, they have like a level of control or they can just act like they fucking agree with it. So then like you don't nobody's looking at you like you're a problem. You basically you just sort of send it down the line like no problem here. Look, we have uh, enough is enough T-shirts. Um, I actually have an, an, an enough is enough thing. Uh, enough is enough as far as just going after what guys do to women. How about we balance it out, you know? And some on all the shit that fucking women do to guys, you know. Oh, that'll never happen. Oh, you can't do that. If you do that, then you're a fucking sexist. We're gonna fix the male-female dynamic by only examining the behavior of men, <laughs> because the ladies are perfect. I would love to know what sweatshop makes those enough is enough T-shirts. 
Who the fuck is Michael Moore been lately? Well, actually, it's a T-shirt sold here in Canada, and God knows he blows everybody north of fucking Minnesota. He just thinks, every, like, you know, like, every, like Canada can do no wrong, despite the fact it's one of the most overtly racist places I've ever been to. Um, the entire country, you know what I mean? But all you got to do is put on a silly hat and take some syrup out of a fucking tree, and then Michael Moore is just like, oh, my God, these people are amazing. Um, oh, Bill, why would you do that? Why, why, why would you have such a nice, friendly podcast and then, you know, just have to pick on, you know, punch up, Bill. Why can't you punch up? So what I've learned here about Vancouver, uh, other than it's, it's beautiful and that they like, they like buildings that look like the buildings that Godzilla steps on. I've noticed that. Um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of money from China here. You know, I don't know what the fuck happened in China. But some sort of crackdown happened and there was a bunch of rich Chinese people where they were just like, oh, fuck, we got to get our money out of this country. And they started buying up property along Sunset Strip, a bunch of places in the United States and evidently here in Vancouver. And I got to I got to commend um, Chinese people with money. Those people know where to fucking buy, you know, although I think Vancouver's smarter than L.A. with the global warming, with all, you know, it's lush land up here with all the water, you know, lakes and everything. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, I don't know. That must be incredible to leave China and come to Vancouver where you can actually have space. But then it'd be weird because you'd miss, you know, you'd miss your country, right? But uh, I don't know, just having been over there, how crowded it is and how dirty the air is. It's got to be fucking incredible because I think it's incredible just coming up from L.A., you know. Um, and there was like a fucking zillion people, all these people coming out here lugging their goddamn skis. Skiing is fucking incredible, but I got to tell you, you literally have to be like your own roadie, you know. And there was all these people like, you know, you got to go snowboard, man. You can just have that like a backpack, just throw it over your fucking shoulders, right? It seems to be like I was just sort of analyzing it. Like skiing scares the shit out of me because it's like every year some fucking guy around my age, it's usually people my age, you know, late 40s, early 50s, and they just come down a trail and they hit a tree and then that's just fucking it. But the last time I skied, I was in Utah and uh, doing a gig out there and the comedian I was working with wanted to go skiing. So we went, I fucking dislocated my thumb and like nine times, I thought I was going to blow out my knees. Um, and I vowed I would never go again. And if I did, I would go snowboarding. I would much rather deal with a broken tailbone or a fucked up wrist than a blown out knee. Um, you know, at my, at my advanced age. Um, so anyways, I am going to go over to the venue right now because... Uh, they allegedly, they got a drum kit backstage at that place. So I think I'm going to go over there and go jam, man, on some fucking tunes. Good, clean, fun. And then I'm going to do my two shows. And listen to this. I come home, I go to bed, and then I have to get up at 4 in the morning because I have to call. Uh, I got to call back east because I got a big show coming up in Boston. And I got to sell a bunch of tickets. So And they want me to come on the radio live. And uh, so that's going to be my day. So I'm going to wake up at four in the fucking morning, do that shit, and then go to the goddamn airport and then come home. And uh, my daughter's going to be like fucking bouncing off the walls, ready to play. But you know what? It's going to be great. You know what's cool is she, uh, we have this doorway to our house where it's got like, you know, you got the door and then along both sides it has like these, those old fashioned like little windows that go from the top all the way down to the bottom. So uh, it's the greatest thing ever when you come home because she's looking through, smiling at you. But it's the worst when you leave, you know, because she has like the saddest look on her face because now she actually understands when you're leaving. So um, and I got a feeling it's only going to get worse. I just don't want to get to the point where it's like I'm never want to be the point where I leave so much that it's no big deal. You know, like I remember a long time ago. Danny Gans, the late Danny Gans, told a story of how he ended up in Vegas. Is his kid drew a, a family portrait, and he, it was the mother and all the kids. And then he goes, "Oh, that's great. Where's Daddy?" And then she pointed, and she had drawn an airplane, and he was on the airplane flying away. I was like, "Oh, fuck." Um, 
But what am I going to do? This is what the fuck I do for a living. Uh, we also announced some dates over uh, two dates, um, one in Dublin and one in uh, London. And I know I got some shit from people. Why don't you come here? Why don't you come there? I'm going to do more of an extensive tour uh, through Europe uh, at some point. I just have to figure out. I got to balance my new life here with the wife and kid. Um, but I definitely want to get to places that I've been before and places that I have never been. Uh, I just have to figure out how to do it. But when I go to um, that Dublin in London gig, that's that's the week of my 50th birthday. So I'm doing Dublin uh, first, and then I'm doing Royal Albert Hall, which is insane that I'm going to be there. I can't believe it. And that's going to be for my 50th birthday. And uh, then I'm taking a week off. And hanging with, you know, my wife and kid and everything. And that's how I'm going to celebrate. I'm turning 50, man. What the fuck? So, I don't know. Most, a lot of my friends didn't make it this far. So, I'm not going to bitch about it. But uh, it's a big number. Okay. Hey, it's a rough one. All right. All right. Well, that's the podcast. Thank you guys for listening. And thank you to everybody up here in Vancouver. They came out to the show last night and are coming tonight. Um, Amazing crowd last night. And I think it's going to be more of the same tonight. Have a great weekend, you cunts. And I'll talk to you on Monday. What's up, everybody? It's Bill Burr, and it is the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, March the 8th, 2010. Oh, my God. Could you believe the Oscars last night? I can't believe that Kelly Wiggin twatting face didn't get best supporting cunt for uh, let's make a fucking Afghan in the 1800s. Do you know, I'm actually still in San Jose right now, and I was supposed to have a show tonight. I'm actually recording this on Sunday. I was supposed to have a show tonight, but it got canceled because everybody evidently is watching the fucking Oscars. I can understand if you're abroad and you want to watch that shit. I get it. That's like your Super Bowl, where you get to sit there and watch the different dresses and which couple is with which couple And who just broke up? And are they there with their new boyfriend or girlfriend? And, oh, my God, did they ignore each other on the red carpet and look at some fucking twat's yank back face as she talks about their shoes? I get that. But where the fuck were the men in San Jose who had had enough fucking balls left in their relationship to be like, you know what? I'm not going to your stupid fucking Oscar party. Okay? Because I don't want to listen to fucking 98 different reads of, oh, my God, you know? Oh, my God, why is she wearing that dress? Oh, my God, she looks so beautiful. Oh, my God, that was like the best speech ever. Huh? Is that what you did? Are you sitting in your cubicle right now as a man? Is that what you did last night? Because if you did, you should be hanging your fucking head. Huh? What happened? Let's go down memory lane, okay? Go all the way back to high school when you still had a set of balls between your fucking legs. Remember that? They were brand new and they were ready to go. I got a question for you. Where the fuck did they go? Because you you definitely didn't have them, men of San Jose. Because you weren't at my fucking show last night to the point it had to be canceled. Granted, I'm not going to lie. About a fucking month and a half ago, a married couple came out of a bar, got into it with a bouncer. A cop showed up, and he fucking tased the dude's wife and shot the guy in the abdomen, and the dude damn near bled out right in front of the improv here. Look it up online. They got the picture. You know, after there's a shooting, they clean up the mess. There's always the fucking uh, old ketchup stains on the sidewalk and a couple of articles of clothing, and then it's fucking hilarious. And then right, right next to it, they had the marquee. And it still said Eddie Griffin. (laughs) It was funny. 
So, yeah, I guess that isn't good for fucking business. But um, I got to tell you, man, I had a great time coming up here. And I've avoided coming to San Jose because I was worried that uh, basically what happened Sunday night, I thought it was going to happen all week. Because I don't know what it is about California. I just feel like if you're not a, you're not a fucking Latino comic, you know, I just don't, or, or super famous, you're not going to sell any tickets out here because, you know, people put that in my head. Um, but no, a lot of people came out on uh, Saturday night. They actually had a balcony. That was the thing about on, on Friday. Nobody showed up. Right. So there I am. I'm standing in this huge fucking theater and the entire upper deck is empty. I felt like I was performing at a fucking Royals game. You know, I felt like I should have been like singing the national anthem or something like that. And then yelling at my manager, wondering what happened to my fucking music career that I couldn't at least sing it like an Angels game. Those fucking idiots got to come out there with their, 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 their goddamn noisemakers. How lame are you as fans that the ownership is basically saying, you know what? You guys have such a lack of passion. We need to we need to to invent something to make it sound like you guys care way more than you really do. Here, here's a couple of inflatable fucking plastic balloons. Just slam them together. We'll even get a monkey. We'll have a crazy monkey out there. Fucking angels. Um anyways, what am I doing here? What the fuck am I talking about? Um, I actually had, I had a great weekend, and uh, believe it or not, you wouldn't know it from my voice, and I found a great sushi place out here. Check out Smile Sushi, sushi if you get a chance to. I don't know where the fuck it is, but you have the internet, right? Look at me. I'm fucking walking around right now. I'm looking out the window. They got a museum across the street, and they have a Star Trek exhibition, and you should have seen these fucking nerds. You should have seen these fucking nerds just... just just standing outside, like waiting for a museum to open. That's when you know you're a fucking nerd, okay? Everybody's gone to a museum. But who the fuck has ever stood outside a museum with your face pressed against the glass waiting to, <laughs> for the fucking thing to open up? You know? Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I, I see back in the day, you're, what, you're waiting for fucking concert tickets. You know what I mean? Back in the day when they used to have, like, actually have record stores... And the artists would come through and you'd be standing outside strawberries, records and tapes, you know, waiting to have your cassette signed by Brian Adams. <laughs> why did I pick Brian Adams? I'll tell you why, because I, I'm staying at a very nice hotel as I've made it to that level in this business. All right. I am on the 14th floor, the penthouse fucking level. Although I just have a suite. I haven't got to that level yet. And I'm looking out the barren fucking landscape here as far as people go anyways um but anyways i went down to the fucking uh, place to have breakfast and the second i walked in right all i see is 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 cloth napkins and leather bound menus so right there you know it's going to be like 58 bucks for an omelet so all i want to do is stop and turn around and get the fuck out of the place but do i of course i don't you know why? Because there's so few people in there that everybody looked at me when I came in. And it reminded me of this time when I went to this titty bar in Troy, New York. I believe it was Troy, New York. It was called the Cloud Nine. Any perverts out there? You know what the fuck I'm talking about. It's not really a, it's sort of a strip club, sort of a guy's house. I would have to describe it as. I just remember there was an upstairs when he came walking in that literally looked like some old lady should have came down in her house coat and just been like, hey, can you, can you stop all the stripping? I'm trying to sleep. Um, and then some sort of double-wide trailer that sold videos that was attached to the other side of it. But anyways, long story short, I went in there with two other people who will remain nameless because I don't name names on the fucking podcast because I'm old school. Um... I can't even fucking remember who they are anyways. I've talked to my cell phone so fucking much. So anyways, I walk into the goddamn place. We all walk in, and the second we walk in, all we want to do is turn around and walk out. But there's so few fucking people in there, everybody's looking at us. The dancer, the fucking DJ, the fucking uh, porky guy who runs the goddamn place, and the two fucking uh, immigrant truckers who were sitting in there. I believe they were Yugoslavian. I can't remember what. So, you, you know, you just fucking go in and sit down. So I went in and I sat down at this fucking breakfast place. I'm back to the breakfast place. All right, try to keep up. I'm playing these fucking brain games on the internet, all right? My fucking brain is sharp. It's coming back. Um, God, I'm lonely. Anyways, um, so I sit down at this fucking breakfast place and... Uh, 
there's this uh, medium-sized woman who suffers from vocal fry. And for those of you who didn't major in communications and didn't have to take a career speech class, vocal fry is basically uh, a way of speaking where you're not, you're not forcing enough air through your vocal cords. So you, start, you talk like this. Have you ever, you ever heard people talk like that? Oh, my God. I was up at Amy's house the other day, and I just felt like she was giving me this vibe. Or you have the other people who start off where they, 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 they push enough air through their vocal cords, but then towards the end, they, they, they taper off. Today, everyone, we're going to be reading about a lady who... And it fucking drives you nuts. It never used to bug me until I took a class on it. Now I can't stop hearing it. So this fucking idiot is sitting there talking. Like the typical, like... I don't know. She sounded very intelligent, but all she was talking about was like Us Magazine shit. And meanwhile, I was listening to a instrumental of a Brian Adams song over the fucking radio. You know, when Brian Adams first came out and he had the Fonzie leather jacket, right? And you're like, wow, this guys he's got some decent tunes. You know? Got my first real 60. Remember that? Remember when you were so young you thought that that actually rocked? But it wasn't bad for Pup. And then he just fucking jumped the shark where he's just like, you know what? I can't fucking do this anymore. My face is breaking out. I can't fucking do it anymore. I'm just going to sell out. I want to write a song for chicks. Richard Marks can do it. So can I. And then he had that song. Look into my eyes. La, 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 la. Stick it up. Your twat. That song, I can't tell you. That stupid fucking song, they used to make receptionists tear up all across this country when it would come on in, in a dental office. Um, they had an instrumental version of that going on as I ate my fucking scrambled eggs and listened to this fat fuck talk about Little House on the Prairie with vocal fry. So that was probably the low point of the weekend. Um, I don't even know what I'm talking about. You know what? I did want to hype. I wanted to hype. Jesus Christ, that was only 10 minutes. There's no fucking way I'm making this one. This one's going to be short and sweet, everybody. Or short and mediocre, however you want to fucking call it. Let's hit the refresh page. Let's see how the Bruins and the Penguins are doing. Bruins need to win this one. Got to make sure we make the playoffs so we can fucking lose in the first round. Still one-to-one after two periods. Two friends of mine, Billy Gardell and Randy Bowman, or Bowman, are at the, uh, at the Penguins game right now. Randy Bauman from uh, Jim and Randy Show, WDVE in Pittsburgh. Have a fucking listen. They're sitting there talking shit, texting me, talking shit, you know, right before the game about how the Penguins were going to kill the Bruins. You know, we're having an off year. And lo and behold, you know, an hour goes by, there's no shit talking. So I go on the Internet, and there it is, 0-0 zero, zero after the first fucking period. Fucking asshole Penguin fans. You know Harry Sinden of the Bruins was actually debating suing the Pittsburgh Penguins when they switched to black and gold for stealing the Bruins' colors? You know, I'm going to pause here and let the people in Pittsburgh exhale and be like, Oh, the fucking Pittsburgh Steelers are back to take care. The Bruins have been around since before the fucking Steelers. And the Steelers back in the day used to basically have yellow uniforms. They had that big stupid yellow helmet. That's what they had. All right, and the only black you had was a couple of little stripes. That's all it was. Back then when you played the old 23 skidoo, the long, I say the long pass when you were doing that shit. So I don't want to hear it. Um, and plus, you know what I mean? Who, who, who the fuck takes the exact same colors as another team in the same league? Okay, you started off with your gay little baby blue fucking penguin. You know, first of all, you're penguins. Why am I talking shit? I, I'm going to get hit with the obvious. When was the last time you guys won a cup? 1972. Then shut the fuck up, Bill. Fine, I will. All right, you just keep enjoying that fucking whiny pussy. He's not a pussy, but have you ever seen... I haven't seen anybody whine the way Cindy Crosby whines since fucking... He's like Danny Ainge on skates. Pau, if Pau Gasol played fucking hockey and was a good-looking guy with full ruby red lips from Nova Scotia... <laughs> <laughs> all right so whatever let's hit refresh again do they at least make the end of the fucking period here come on bruins there we go the end of two one to one what do you got to say now there billy gardell fucking cocksucker all right um what was i trying to say here um 
Oh, I know. I wanted to hype his, uh, one of the fans here on the podcast who will also remain nameless, um, has started a fan page for the Monday morning podcast. Okay. So I'm actually going to the next level with this podcast. Um, a lot of times I make references and, uh, you know, people, you know, don't have time to look them up or maybe you don't want to go all over the internet trying to figure out what the fuck I'm talking about. This guy has a bunch of, uh, you know, has links to some of the references. He, you know, does all that Photoshop stuff. He does all that computer stuff that I don't know how to describe. But basically, if you'd like to check it out at the end of the podcast or maybe follow along, you can go to a page called uh, www.themmpodcast.com. www.themmpodcast.com. No spaces. Okay? And there you go. I'm hyping that for the week. Um, see, this is why I don't hype shit. Now I just, whatever flow I just fucking had is out the goddamn window. What else did I do here? You know what I like about San Jose is it, it is actually a hockey town. Like um, in my hotel, they have the NHL channel. And I was sitting there watching Hockey Night in Canada, which is Saturday night. Um... And I, what the fuck was I watching? I was watching Toronto versus Ottawa, and uh, I had to go do my show. But coming up, they had uh, the L.A. Kings versus the Canadians. With any luck, they fucking beat them. Did they beat them? You know what? I'm going to check. God knows I got nothing else to talk about on this fucking podcast. Um, no, you know what? Let's continue the sports theme just so we can get rid of all the people who aren't into sports and are into other things like politics. The fuck is up with that? What's the deal with people who are informed? Um, on a number of weeks ago, I actually I, I ripped Peyton Manning a new asshole, and upon listening back to it, you know, I actually sounded like half a fucking retard. I will definitely admit that, but uh, I still stand by my opinions. And uh, I kept bringing up a guy by the name of Terry Bradshaw, who has four Super Bowl rings. And uh, you know, everybody hit me with, "Dude, you only threw for like twenty five thousand fucking yards." Well, they have a great article on Terry Bradshaw in uh, Sporting News Magazine this week or this month. I don't really read this magazine, but um, that kid from uh, Nebraska was on the cover. That uh, Dama, Dama, Damukong Su, Damukong Su. I don't know. He's got a great fucking name, and. Uh, the Patriots needed defensive tackle, but I know we're not going to draft high enough to get that guy. But I just wanted to read about him because I figured maybe they talk about other defensive tackles that were available because I have no life. Uh, but anyways, I opened it up and lo and behold, there was a great article about Terry Bradshaw, which basically backs up what the fuck I was talking about. At least in my world, it does. And, uh, and they mentioned right in the beginning, it said... Uh, Bradshaw won his fourth and final Super Bowl ring with an MVP performance for the Steelers at the Rose Bowl. Among quarterbacks, only Joe Montana has that record, and it's quite possibly none will ever surpass it. Okay, all you Peyton Manning fans out there, do you think he's going to get five fucking rings? You think he'll get four? I think he could possibly get three. He's not getting four, though. All right? And this is coming from fucking Terry Bradshaw, a man who played the game. This is, what, this is a quote from the article. The only thing that matters in the pros is winning the Super Bowl. I've never had anyone come up to me in my life and say, Hey, Terry, how many yards did you throw for? How many touchdown passes do you have? It's all about rings. Does that sound familiar? Go listen to the fucking February 8th podcast. Maybe Terry listens to my podcast. <laughs> How fucking arrogant is that? Um, but then he says, uh, he says it's all about rings. But, dude, the, the, the shit that this guy took, you know, I knew in the beginning of his career that this guy had a rough time in Pittsburgh and everybody, you know, basically treated him like a dumb redneck. And uh, kind of like what they did with John Rocker. I always thought John Rocker got a bum deal because I was living in New York and they were basically calling this guy a fucking moron redneck in not so many words. And then he comes out and starts trashing New York. And then typical media, they get to step away like they didn't incite any of it, you know. And all the Mets fans get to act like they weren't fucking yelling shit at him. I used to be doing a bit about that. That uh, but that, the, the, the punchline was basically you had date rapists and wife beaters throwing batteries at a bigot. 
That was basically, that was my little fucking social commentary on the John Rocker incident. Let me get back to this shit. Not supporting anything that John Rocker said, but you know what I mean? It's like, you know, if you're going to fucking throw rocks rocks at a a, a hornet's nest, yeah, I don't know. Did I I almost just say you're going to get stung? You know what I almost just created there was one of those southern fucking expressions that I love so much. Faster and turkey shit through a tin horn. I'll tell you, that boy, that boy would fuck a rock if he thought a snake was under it. Anybody from down south can just send me a whole list of those fucking things. Have I already done this on the podcast and I don't remember? I absolutely love those fucking expressions. That boy would fuck mud. <laughs> I don't even know what they mean. That boy would fuck a rock if he thought a snake was under it. How does that make any sense? But, you, but, but what I love about it is even though it doesn't make sense... You, you understand what the person is saying. And there, there's a genius to that. So anyways, um, let me, uh, let, let's read about Terry Bradshaw's er, uh, the early part of his fucking career. Basically, yeah, they, they, were, they were shitting all over him. Well, why, why don't we have Terry say it here? He said, you have to understand something. My first five years were not the best. I had shit thrown in my face. I was booed, criticized, called stupid and dumb. Players talking about were saying this is a, players on his teams were saying uh, we win in spite of him. He stutters in the huddle. I had so much of that shit thrown at me, I got bitter about it. And my coach, who I thought never defended me in public, Chuck Knoll, um, the thing was I was never his chosen one. I had to sit back and come to grips with all that, and it was very painful for me. It wasn't a storybook career, so I take a great deal of pride in being the quarterback of the team that won all those Super Bowls. Yeah, and the guy never gets the fucking respect. Do you know before Super Bowl thirteen, uh, Thomas Hollywood Henderson said uh, Terry Bradshaw couldn't spell cat if you spotted him the C and the A. So they asked Bradshaw about this. And if you watch football, you know, he always comes off like this guy just being all silly and joking around. But he goes, well, it ticked me off. The thing that ticked me off was nobody defended me. Who came out on my team and said, bullshit, he calls the plays. He sets it up. Who defended me? Chuck Knoll didn't, didn't defend me. The only guy I know who said something was Joe Green. And then here I got to deal with this thing going into the Super Bowl. What the hell am I going to do? I'm smart enough to know not to get in that argument with Hollywood Henderson through the media because it's a distraction. Um, I don't have time for that shit. Okay, so I can't spell cat if you spot me the C and the T. Uh, that's some good shit. Congratulations. Then you go out and you kick their asses. How much, how's my spelling look now? You're the one who had to go to prison. <laughs> he took it there. Terry's an angry motherfucker or whatever. I love it. I love it. You know something? And he never went back to Pittsburgh. I didn't even notice that shit. When he was done, he just left. He doesn't even talk to any of the players. And he said, he goes, I mean, it's kind of uh, a failure of my personality. I don't know. It's a really interesting article because if you watch him on uh, whatever the hell the show is called, the NFL pregame, he still plays it up like he's this, you know, this, this, just, just this country boy. But he isn't. He's fucking sharp as attack. And uh, he didn't like the way he was treated in Pittsburgh. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that considering those guys, um, how seriously they take their team and their fucking quarterback and gave him four Super Bowls. He treated them like such shit, you know? I just like like when teams do that to their fucking players because it makes Boston fans look better because God knows we're a bunch of fucking assholes, you know? Kind of like when Montreal booed Patrick Waugh out of town. I love bringing this shit up. And then he goes out to fucking Colorado and immediately wins a Stanley Cup and then like four years later wins another one. I love that. Now Montreal hasn't been a factor since fucking 1993. I love that too. It's over. Their last dynasty was 1979. They dominated a six-team league that spilled over into the expansion six. And then everybody got their shit together. And you haven't heard anything from those motherfuckers since. And they're still walking around with their chest puffed out about some shit that they did back in the Three Stooges era. You know? It's fucking over. 30 years ago. It's been 30 years since you guys dominated the fucking NHL. All right, so get off your goddamn high horses. All right, that ought to get me a couple of emails. Okay, let's continue on with the, uh, with the podcast here. Um, here's a couple of uh, videos if you want to watch. This is one that I wanted you guys to check out. Um, there's a video, uh, if you're a Van Halen fan, go on YouTube and check out Van Halen, and it's a song, and the cradle will rock. If you just search that, uh, a bunch of videos will come up and click on the second video down. 
And uh, just look what David Lee Roth is wearing. It's absolutely fucking hilarious. But I'm telling you, as funny as it is, there's going to be a part of you being like, God damn it. I wish I could get away with wearing something like that. Can you imagine the amount of pussy I would get if I wore something like had the balls to wear something like that? For those of you who aren't near a fucking, I'll, I'll basically describe it, who aren't near a fucking computer right now. Maybe you're on a treadmill trying to work off that burger you ate at Carl's Jr. At 2 in the morning, knowing you shouldn't have done it. Woke up this morning feeling like you had a fucking anchor in your stomach. You're like, oh, I got to go fucking sweat it off. He's basically wearing a um, picture if you, if, you, if you had a zoot suit made out of spandex and all you were wearing was the pants. So they basically came up right underneath your fucking chest. Right. <laughs> and then do you remember those you remember those fucking and they're in their purple sparkle, too. All right. And then that's it. You don't have anything else on other than do you remember those boots that those whores used to wear in Aspen in like the late 70s, early 80s, where they look like they skinned a woolly mammoth. He has on white woolly mammoth snow boots. And uh, the greatest thing is the crowd is just fucking staring because it's early on in their career. I don't know if it's from another country. I have no fucking idea. I haven't watched it in a while, but I was just remembering it. And I wanted you guys just check it out. Jesus Christ. I told that fucking story in real time. All right. Here's another one. Uh, Another YouTube video somebody sent me. It says, uh, check out Dwarf Midget's Killer Muay Thai. M-U-A-T-H-A-I. This is basically, it's, it's very, you know, uh, very accurately descript, uh, described. It, it's, one guy is a dwarf and the other guy's a midget or a little person. That's the new weight class that they invented, a little person. And they are, uh, <laughs> they're fighting somewhere, I, I'm going to guess, in maybe the Philippines. And it's a Muay Thai fight. And it starts off funny. Then you think it's fake. Because the midget keeps hitting the dwarf with the exact same fucking punch. The dwarf keeps trying to knee knee the midget in the chest. And the midget keeps coming with an overhand right. And I kept thinking, why the fuck is he keep why the fuck does he keep throwing the same punch? This must be fake. But then I realized that the boxing gloves on the midget actually go beyond his elbow. So he couldn't throw a hook if he wanted to. <laughs> and then after that it just becomes sad. There's something about the dwarf's face where he just really looks like he's getting he, – he's, he's physically in pain. The midget has – you know, he's still got that, 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 that Christmas twinkle in his eye. He seems like he's having a good time. He's got a little bit of swagger in his waddle. He's probably getting some pussy after the show, you know. And uh, that's a good question. Would you ever let a midget bang you, women out there? I know some guys have banged uh, a little person, but I was just wondering, you know. You just laid down on your stomach and you just felt like that, like that, <laughs> God. that wiggling eight-year-old riding you from behind. <laughs> Do you know how long your hair would have to be so you could actually pull it in that position? Why am I being such an asshole this week? I don't know why. All right, next, uh, next YouTube video. I'll tell you why. Because I don't have a fucking show. I don't have a show tonight. And I'm waiting to take a red eye. Jet blue. Jet blue. Back to... Uh, JFK. Um, uh, not looking forward to going back to New York this time of year with that fucking weather. I really have not missed the winter whatsoever. That's a big thing they ask in the East Coast. Don't you miss the Four Seasons? What, Frankie Valley and those guys? Huh? Is that what you say? Do I miss the Four Seasons? No, I don't. No, I don't. I like it. I like being old and being in the retirement community that is Los Angeles. I like it. It's you know what L A is like. It's like uh, it's like Florida for somebody who's still middle aged. You know, you go to Florida to die. That's the last place I'll go. Go out there, get me a gator boat. You know, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm, I'm going to parachute out of my life. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'll probably get a divorce and just say, listen, I'm cashing in my chips. I can't do this. We had kids. All right, it's fucking over. They're out of the house. What are we going to do? Stare at each other for the rest of fucking time. So I sit there watching you slowly gumming those waffles that you used to be able to tear through and an English muffin in a minute and a half. Now we sit here for fucking 37 minutes. So I watch, ugh, I don't want to live that life with you, okay? We had a great time. I'd give you a high five, but I'm afraid I'm going to break your shoulder. And then, I'll go, <laughs> and then I'm going to go down to Florida and I'm just going to get one of those fucking boats with the fan on the back and I'm going to give Everglade tours. 
is I'm going to play some Pantera and some ACDC. I'm going to have an affected southern accent. And that's it. And I'm going to live off my DVD money, even though it won't exist anymore. Um, and I'm going to dress all in khaki. Okay, let's continue on. Um, the next YouTube video that you can look at is uh, there's one called uh, Public Access TV Hosts Bombarded with Prank Calls is the name of it. I don't know if this is the right video. Somebody sent this one to me, and I accidentally deleted it. So I just by him describing it, I think this is the one. So look it up. And it's basically a guy in public access trying to talk about gun control. And it's such a low budget that, you know, it's not pre it's, it's basically live. And he puts his phone number up there. So somebody calls in, realizes is it, you know, realizes that it's live and tells him to go fuck himself. And then the entire audience, like a bunch of goddamn children call in and all they're saying is just the dirtiest shit that they can basically think of. And now the best guys are the ones who actually <laughs> start talking about gun control for a minute. So this guy actually feels like he's having a, a discussion. <laughs> and right as the guy starts to engage with them, they tell him to go fuck himself. So if you're an angry prick like me, it's a ni- it's actually a uh, it's a nice one. So with that, um I have been on lumosity.com for all of last week uh trying to get my BPI score to go up, which is I don't even know what the fuck it stands for. Basically, the higher the number you have, the less uh moron i don't know i was gonna say retarded but i don't like using that word uh, even though i've already said it five times this fucking podcast the less dumb you are i guess or the smarter you are the higher it is right i got confused in the middle of it i don't know i'm worried about my brain right now everybody because uh it's feeling fuzzy and i think a lot of it has to do with talking on my cell phone too much and i'm trying to cut down on that like a cigarette smoker and I've been going to this this website, Lumosity.com. It has these these games that challenge your brain. It's it's they're, they're fucking awesome, and they got everything out any any type of any type of stuff that you could be thinking of. I don't know if I talked about this last week, so I'll kind of blow through it. It's Lumosity, L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y dot com. Somebody else also su- suggested one that was uh, I don't know how to read it because it's a website here. It's all I don't know how to say it here. It's it's www no spaces here. P O S I T S C I E N C E. So it's Posit Science. P O S I T Science dot com. Um, and they have these brain games. And I really think in a, in a number of years, that's right. I did talk about this last week. That they're, that they're basically instead of having all these these exercise shows at night that involve you know getting fucking abs and all that type of shit, they're actually going to be selling stuff late at night that's going to be basically crunches for your brain. And um, I would recommend it. It's kind of been my new thing that I do out here. I told you I've been trying to learn learn how to write with my right hand. I tell you about that shit. I'm a lefty, and somebody, this comedian, was telling me about this book that he was reading. That uh, if, if you actually do things with your op- opposite hand, it opens up different areas of your brain. And um, so I've been doing that. You know, I'm writing with my right hand. I've been throwing shit around my my hotel room with my left hand. I'm kind of fucked up where I, I, I kind of jump back and forth. Play guitar lefty. I play drums righty. I play sports right-handed. I write left-handed. I can use tools either hand. Fucking rub one out with the left, but in a pinch. Okay, let's plow ahead. So this is the type of shit I've been doing. So I've been learning how to write with my right hand. And I basically, my handwriting with my right hand looks, at, looks like my handwriting in like fourth grade. Um... Looks like if I, w- <laughs> if I was in the fourth grade and um, I just saw a ghost. That's the way it looks. It's looking very spooky. But uh, I've also been trying to learn how to become a better speller. I just, you know something? Like, I always make fun of how the fact that I'm a fucking moron. And um, like Terry Bradshaw, I definitely play up my stupidity. But there's definitely a seed of, uh, or maybe some people would say, a deep well of stupidity that, that I actually have. And most of it... Um, is out of just laziness. I mean, there's no reason why I shouldn't know how to spell the word restaurant at my age. I've been to a bunch of them, and I've tried to spell it a million times. And for the life of me, I always forget if the U comes after the first A or the second A. And um, I've tried this a number of times, and I'm going to try to stick with it as I just, as I, you know, try to type an email 
And rather than just hitting spell check and just moving on with my life, I'm trying to actually make a list of words that I don't know how to sell. Sell. Spell. See how my brain's fucked up? Um, and then what I do is I, then I write, I write the word properly like 10 times in a row, um, but I write it with my right hand. So I'm kind of doing two things at once, and it's fucking hilarious because I kind of left this shit out. And I was just thinking of the poor cleaning lady coming in here. Like one of the words I was learning how to spell was penitentiary. So I have penitentiary written like fucking 12 times in this spooky, I'm writing with my opposite hand, (laughs) fucking penmanship. And I just kept thinking of the shining. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, you know? So uh, I don't know. Trying to become a smarter human being. Am I boring the shit out of you? Because I think that last segment was a little boring. But I'm into this shit, man. I'm sick of just knowing stuff about sports. I actually, you know what? I'm going to Europe in two weeks. And and I desperately do not want to come off as the typical stupid American. At least I'm in shape. Okay? So I'm going to be, you know, representing us nicely in that category. The fact that I'm 41 years old and I'm still fucking in shape. Jesus Christ, I almost fell backwards on this chair. I didn't understand how far away the curtains were. I should have gone with it. At least it would have been fucking funny. Let me see if I can lean back here. Easy, easy, easy. It's not working. Um, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Hang on one second. Hello? Hey, let me call you back in like 20 minutes, okay? Okay, cool. All right, bye. Um, so anyways... Uh, the fuck am I talking about? I got a, um, I got this magazine, Scientific American, because I'm like, I can't keep reading these fucking sports magazines. And dude, there was a guy in there, these eggheads, when they want to, as much as I love trashing people, if you notice, you know, I just insult the way you look and I say fuck a lot, but these guys are actually intelligent human beings. And this guy was making fun of people who tell stories. You ever see those stories where people say they died? I I was dead for two minutes and then I came back and then they come on and they start talking about the stuff that they saw. But the the way this scientist guy breaks the shit down, scientist guy, did I really just say that? The way this this, this science dude, right, the way he breaks it down, um, it's just fucking brilliant. He basically says, you're not dead. You had a near-death experience. You were in a, in a, uh, a, a near-death state. You weren't dead. If you were dead, you're dead. They can't bring you back from being dead. All right? Even if your fucking heart stops, just because your heart stops, the dying process, this guy was, the way he broke it down, he said, it can take anywhere from a couple of minutes to a couple of hours to occur depending on the conditions. So even if somebody, unless you get just fucking blown up, vaporized, even if somebody shoots you in the fucking heart, your brain is still going to be firing synapses and whatever the fuck. I'm too stupid to know what it is, but it still takes another couple of minutes. And other stuff, like he said, can take up to a couple of hours. So these fucking people who think they're dead are not dead. And they're coming on TV talking about the shit they saw like they, like they were in another fucking, I don't know, universe. And they weren't. So he basically, in the Deepak Chopra... Is trying to, you know, is on this Larry King show describing what's going on. So the guy basically concludes it with this. When, uh, cause one other scientist was actually kind of agreeing with Deke Park Chopra by saying, you know, there's some stuff out there that we just, you know, science, you know, has no explanation for. And this guy says, so what? The fact that we cannot fully explain a mystery without natural means does not mean it requires a supernatural explanation. It just means we don't know everything. Such uncertainty is at the very heart of science and is what makes it such a challenging enterprise. And in that moment, there was a clap of thunder, and I realized that science is religion for intelligent people. This guy isn't saying that there's no God, but he's also not listening to some guy half-naked dancing around a fucking fire with a chicken foot. You know what I mean? So I think that's what I think. I think science is religion for intelligent people. And I think religion, in a lot of ways, is science for morons. Whenever they can't explain something, they invent stories of people having, you know, all-you-can-eat fish coming out of a wicker basket or fucking, you know, you got to have faith. You got to have faith. 
It's a fucking cop out. You know? If you went to go buy a fucking car and you go, all right, let me, the, the, the car wouldn't start up. Don't worry. Don't worry. One of these days that engine's coming back and it's going to be mad and it's going to be judging you. It's ridiculous. You know, oh, Jesus. I don't want to get off on this fucking rant, but definitely check it out, man. If you want to read some cool stuff, it's called Scientific American. And uh, I don't know. I'm kind of on this mission. I'm, I'm sick of being a moron. I'm sick of being, you know. I'm sick of being fucking stupid. I really am. Um, so, anyways, let's get to uh, let's get to underrated, overrated. Um, what are we? Thirty-eight minutes in. Look at me. I really can fucking run my mouth when I want to. Before I get into underrated, overrated, I got to read this one, and I'm going to need some help from you guys on this. Um, listen to this one. Uh, this is from some dude. Uh, I believe he's in Italy. And he said, um, I kill women's libidos for a living. All right, here we go. Fucking strap yourselves in for this one. Hey, Bill. Um, I just got out of my second of my two long-term relationships, um, three-plus years, both of which eerily started and ended the same. Uh, both of these girls were well above average in their sexual enlightenment when we started dating. I'm not saying they were super freaks, but the kind of girls that have a porno collection that can rival most guys and the toys to match. Also, the kind of girls that while you're home visiting your parents for the holidays will want to sneak away from the dinner table and fuck in the bathroom. <clears throat> okay. Anyways, um, it seems that the standards for most of these relations... The standard for most relationships is that you fuck like rabbits during the first year. If you manage to make it past uh, the one-year mark, there is an, ex an exponential decay in the pussy rationing until you get married or have kids, at which time you're pretty much done with the sex except for birthdays and the anniversary. However, the sex in these two relationships kept going strong through the second year, at which point it completely dropped off. And I'm not just – and I'm not kidding. J I'm talking just done. I had to pull out every trick in the book just to get a sympathy fuck once every couple of weeks. Um, I'm in a committed relationship and love these girls. Well, I guess you were in a committed relationship and you love these girls, so I guess you didn't fuck around, all right? Um, and love these girls enough to put up with the bullshit with the idea that we'll be able to work through the issue and get back on track. However, as I learned, once the pussy is boarded up, it's out of business for good. It's like those fucking horrific strip malls that have been abandoned since the 80s when whatever shit boom economy in the area made those fucking people think they were going to go somewhere. So inevitably, when these relationships end, I end up, uh, I get read my my fucking straight A report card on how much I'm such a great guy and I'm loved so much and they don't want to lose me as a part of their lives, but they're just not sexually attracted to me anymore. And that is the fucking, and that, that and, and this is the best fucking part. They don't know why. They don't know why they're not sexually attracted to me anymore and really wish they could change it. Seriously, what the fuck? No man wants to admit to himself, let alone an audience, that he's not getting alone that he's not getting that he's not getting it done between the sheets. However, I can honestly say that I do all right. I'm no fucking Ron Jeremy, but I get the job done. I would understand the plight of these women if I was uh fur blasting them. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Just jumping on them like an eighteen year old, pounding away? Or wanting to do the same shit over and over again, but I usually make a pretty good damn effort to make sure things stay fun in the bedroom. All right. Okay. Last two fucking paragraphs. Uh, let me just let me just uh, paraphrase this. He basically says that he's like uh, William H Macy's character in The Cooler, um, and he's saying that he's getting really bitter and he wants to go out right now and go meet a woman, fuck the shit out of her for three months, and then give her the same speech that just happened to him. Um, all right. Okay. First of all, don't do that. Don't deliberately go out and hurt somebody because you dated two people who hurt you. That's just it's, – it's bad. They don't deserve it. They didn't hurt you, so don't do that, all right? Um, I, I don't know what to – I mean I'd have to have more details of what the fuck's going on, but I will tell you this. From experience, I know a lot of people, they get into a relationship with somebody and – it, it doesn't go right. They find out that it's not what they're looking for. And then they go out and then they immediately basically start dating the same person again. 
It's not literally the same person, but it's basically, you know, like just to make it simple, if if a woman went out and was dating, met some guy at a fucking truck stop and he turns out to be an asshole who's driving a truck, fucking a bunch of other women around the country. She goes, I'll never fucking get with a piece of shit like that again. And where does she go? She goes right back down to the truck stop, which is the same gene pool of fucking people. And I think it's very interesting that you met two girls who seemed like they were the exact same, right down to when they wanted to stop fucking you. And I got to admit, okay, I guess a woman having a porn collection is healthy on some level, but that, you know, I don't know. As far as like a girl you're going to marry, it's like you want your girl, it's that fine line. You want them to fuck your brains out, but do you really want to bang, have them want to fuck you in your parents' house? I mean, I don't know, dude. I, I mean... I, what I what I would guess is I I would I would start fishing in a different lake. It sounds to me like you you're uh, fucking uh, goddamn trout again. I can't fucking believe it. You know, go out in the ocean, you'll catch something else. You know what I'm saying? I think you got the same person again. I mean, but I mean, I would literally have to fucking be knowing what you're doing in the bedroom, which I don't want to know. Um. Well, what about you? Do you start tape? I guess you said you don't tape her off. Because that's another thing that happens in relationships, you know. There's like, you know, big thing with women is they like kissing, and uh, guys are very focused on the on on the finish line, the goal. So, you know, you get in that relationship, like we haven't had sex in a while. You want to have sex when you start getting into that fucking thing, it you know, and you just start scheduling it. Uh, how, how does your day look? Maybe around four. Okay. Okay, we will fuck at four. You know, and you're not even self-conscious, so there's no excitement. You just fucking take your clothes off like you're getting strip searched on your way to serving time at fucking uh, some penitentiary. Penitentiary. P-E-N-I-T-E-N-T-I-A-R-Y. Penitentiary. (laughs) Sorry, it's one of the words I learned this week. And I was trying to remember Rikers Island, and I couldn't at that point. So, dude, I don't know what to tell you. The bottom line, I don't give a fuck who you are, how in love you are with somebody. After a while, you're going to get sick of fucking them. That's what happens. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if you have some sort of like delayed halitosis where for the first two years you have wonderful breath and then all of a sudden it's unbearable. I'm just fucking with you. I don't want to give you a complex, but I'm just saying, I don't know what. I would try to to, uh, meet girls in a different place. I would start with that and... um, I don't know. I don't know, dude. This one is beyond me. I've never, uh, I mean, part of me wants to say you're being a little too hard on yourself here. Uh, but whatever, go out there and, uh, you know, go bang some fucking women. You're single, go out there, bang some fucking women. And as always, always talk to women that you think are out of your league. Always do that shit. The worst thing they can do is say no, but one of them is going to fucking say yes. That'll give you more confidence, and you'll keep moving up the draft board. Next thing you know, you're pulling pussy out of the first round rather than drafting like you fucking won the Super Bowl last year. You know, having that 28th pick, praying that the female version of of fucking Dan Marino's still around. That didn't make sense, but you know what I'm saying. Um, Anyways, am I almost done here? 46 minutes in. 46 minutes into the podcast. Let's wrap this shit up here, people, with a little bit of underrated, overrated, shall we? Underrated. Uh, Bill, last week you got an email from a fan that recounted uh, his sister's Wiccan wedding. Personally, I think the ritual was that was discussed in the wedding is fucking mind-numbingly insane. But part of me has to give it up to the couple that got married. Oh, sorry. Underrated is uh, having balls. Um, they knew their ritual would, would not be well received, but they did not give a fuck. It was their day and they had the conviction to do what they wanted, even knowing that their family and guests would not warmly receive the whole gibberish chanting and bloodletting. Okay. So there you go. Having the balls to fucking annoy everyone in your family. Um, another quick thing. Uh, here's something people are traveling to Boston. They know that I grew up there and I also fucking travel around the country. And this guy said, Hey Bill, I'm going there with my wife. She used to, she, um, she used to live there, but I would also, uh, you know, so she knows where to go. I'd like to know, you know, have you tell me where to fuck to go. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Um, I haven't lived there since 1995, dude. So, um, I'm going to try to tell you to go to some of my favorite places from, uh, back in the day. I would start, go to Cappy's Liquors. 
on uh, Route 1 in Saugus, right before, you know, get a good six-pack in you, maybe some Michelobes, and then uh, go up to the uh, go up to the Kowloon, get some fucking Chinese food. <laughs> and of course, another great liquor store out in uh, out in the Boston area is out in Brockton, Massachusetts. Go to Blanchard's Liquor Store out by the Westgate Mall. You might want to check if that's still there, but I know the bowling alley is. That's a great place. You know, go out there and uh, put on some flock of seagulls and try to talk to some chick with way too much uh, who drew a, ch- a triangle of pink on both of her cheeks. Um, I'm just fucking with you. The penalty box. Go to a Bruins game. Go uh, Stop by the penalty box. That's a good bar. It's really alcohol-based. Stay away from the Freedom Trail. Okay? Stay away from the Freedom Trail. I don't know about you guys, but there's nothing more boring to me anyways than the uh, Revolutionary War. It is mind-numbingly boring uh, with the old weaponry. It's like, you know, it's like the original Atari. After you saw this PlayStation shit we've been doing for the last, you know, 50 years. So, oh, you hear that shit? She's singing again. Wait a second. Wait for it. Ah, the fucking guy in the violin. Can you hear it? You probably can't fucking hear it. All right. Um, oh, and somebody uh, sent me something. And this is the last thing I'll tell you guys before I'll, I'll tell you all to have a good fucking week, as I always do, trying to end on a nice positive note. Uh, hey, let me hit refresh here just to see who won this, who's winning this fucking game. Come on. Refresh. Jesus Christ. He, he, isn't it unbelievable how quickly your fucking computer gets old? It's like cool for the first fucking week, and then you download a couple things, and then it's like, you know, it's like Brad Pitt at the beginning of that movie where he played the old baby. Anybody see that movie? I don't think I've ever laughed so fucking hard in my life. When that guy came in and he was trying to get some pussy, and he hears, and he looks down, there was that little old baby. You want to talk about killing a fucking woman's, a guy's libido? The fuck is going on with my computer? Oh, I didn't have the thing. I actually have dial-up right now, if you can believe it. That's probably another one of the problems. All right, here we go. Come on. Come on. Oh, you fucking cunts. Two to one Pittsburgh. 804 left. I like it, though. I forget the name of the guy, but we have a new defenseman. Maybe that'll help us and make up for the fact that we don't have Phil Kessel anymore. Even though, for some reason, a lot of people don't like him. So, anyways, this guy sent me this last thing I'll read you guys. This guy sent me something about, uh, you know, I was talking about when you're going to go buy things and people ask for your phone number and all this fucking information, and it fucking creeps me out. Every time they do that, I just think that they should play in the beginning of that Iron Maiden song, The Prisoner. You remember that from the 80s? Do you remember how that thing went? You remember this? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. Most psycho laugh ever. Can you imagine if your fucking dad would laugh at you like that back in the day? Be like, son, how many beers did you have tonight? You're just like, I just had two. <laughs> right? And you just fucking, all of a sudden the lights start dimming, it's going to be over. So anyways, this fucking guy, did that make any sense, by the way? I don't know. I'm fucking sitting here with one microphone, no headphones in a fucking hotel room. This is what you get. All right. So this guy... Um, said, Bill, can you believe how much fucking information people are willing to give away for no, to strangers for no reason? He goes, I got my hair cut the other day, and the first thing they say to me before hello or what can I do for you is, the first thing out of the gate is, what's your phone number? So I say, why do you need my phone number? She says, so we know who you are when you come in, which is bullshit because they don't know you when you come in. They still have to ask what your goddamn number is. See, you got to love someone who actually fucking uses their brain. So anyway, she goes, he says, I don't want to give you my number. So then she scoffs in his face and says, um, we don't send the information out to anyone. It's just to keep track of you here. That's it. Um, and then she says, uh, then, okay, then the guy says, the guy wrote this really badly here. So then I guess he responds to, that doesn't make me feel any better. You don't need my phone number to cut my hair. Then this slag does this fine whatever that sounded exactly like your exaggerated impression of a dumb broad. Then she goes, how about your address? Dude, this is fucking, 
You know what? All these corporations are sharing this information to figure out exactly what you buy, when you buy it, what you like the best, so they can just fucking, I don't know what. You know? Jack the prices of this shit up. So anyways, um, she goes, how about your address? And the guy goes, what are you going to do? Drop the haircut off at my house? Just cut my fucking hair. <laughs> uh, now there's three people in line behind me in this worthless tub of cum. Jesus. Leans around me and says, and says to, I guess to the people behind him, sorry this takes longer when they, then he writes they, you know, don't give any information. And then he says sarcastically, oh, I see. I'm the one uh, complicating this transaction. And it's not even her fault. It's her, uh, oh, and it's not even her fault. It's her corporate creep bosses and all the fucking sheep that let people do whatever they want. Sorry, this is so long. Well, you should apologize to my listeners because they had to listen to me read it. Yeah, man, don't give those people your fucking phone numbers. Don't give them your address. I do that. Can can we get your phone number? Uh, No, you can't. We're not going to do anything with it. Uh, That's fine. That's fine. I know you're not going to do anything with it. I don't want you to have my phone number. What, are you going to call me up and see how my fucking haircut's going? Is it still short? Or do you think you need an adjustment? Did I tell you that story when I went into CVS? And that guy who looked with the Pee Wee Herman haircut? There was two, two foreigners in front of me. They barely spoke English. And they, he asked if they wanted one of those savey save cards. And they said no. And he goes, that's all right. I'll just scan one anyways. And he scans it. So I walk up and I'm ready for this guy. He goes, do you have our little savey save card? And I say, no, I don't. And he goes, well, I'll just scan it anyways. And I go, no, I don't want you to. And then he scanned it. And I said, I said, excuse me, what did I just say to you? I just said, I don't want that. And you scanned it anyways. Why did you just do that? And he goes, it's all right. I'll unscan it. I'll unscan it. And I go, what, what do you get? Like half a cent for every person that you get, you know, that, that, that you get on the fucking list there. And he goes, no, I don't. It's like, really, is that why you can't make eye contact with me, you fucking piece of shit? He probably didn't even unscan the goddamn thing. You know, I don't understand people who help out corporations. I just don't. Have they done anything to demonstrate that they give a flying fuck about you or the drinking water in your town? Don't help those cunts. I mean, you can if you want to, but that's, I would just, I think it would be a better world if these fucking pricks didn't know every goddamn thing about you. You know, pretty soon you're going to walk in there and they're going to fucking ask if you can put a, uh, if they can just bug you like Gene Hackman in the conversation, right? All right, dude, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. You know what? I'm going to go down and we'll listen to this lady sing her songs so I don't have to think. There's a nice little crowd down there. There's got to be at least 26 people down there, which I think in downtown San Jose actually constitutes a mob. Maybe somebody will get tased and shot in the abdomen. I don't know what. All right, that's the podcast for this week. Thank you guys so much for listening. I am currently revamping my website, and I hope that everything's going to be up to speed. I recently went over uh, 10,000 people on my mailing list, so I'm really excited about that. And uh, if you want to know what's going on, you know, especially if you see, you know, when I switched over to uh, Lipsyn with the podcast and all that fucking shit. If you were out of the loop, it's because you weren't on my mailing list. I'm not sure. Tr- you know, how funny is this? How funny is this? Uh, how fucking hypocritical am I? I just said don't give your phone number out to these cunts. And now here I am asking for your web address. I really did. Why do you people listen to this? I'm an idiot. All right. I'll talk to you next week.